same-sex marriage, abortion, both controversial issues that are increasingly in the public eye, but also issues which Christians can and must stand against. The Bible is clear that marriage is between one man and one woman. It's also perfectly clear that human life begins at conception and that it's sacred. But as with so many things, the Christian stance on marriage and abortion is unpopular in our increasingly secular world. As a result, pressure has been ramping up on jurisdictions which don't allow same-sex marriage or don't allow abortion to liberalise their laws. In the British Isles, Northern Ireland is a bastion all on its own, the only place which still holds to the sanctity of life and the belief that marriage is the union of one man and one woman. Speaking to me about these issues today are the Christian Institute's Northern Ireland officer Callum Webster and pro-life campaigner Dawn McAvoy from Both Lives Matter. Dawn, let's start with you. Since the Republic of Ireland voted to legalise abortion last year, there has been this increased pressure on Northern Ireland to do the same, hasn't there? Yes. Um, I think pro-abortion activists have used the referendum result in the Republic of Ireland to really feed into their push for increased abortion across the UK. And Northern Ireland is seen, I suppose, as the weak link, um, the Achilles heel um, for us and um, for them. So, so yes, I think it has given weight to their energy, um, but we still do not believe that it's inevitable. So it's important to reinvigorate um, those who maybe are a bit tired of the battle. And also, actually, what we have found is that the result of the referendum has um, inspired people who weren't connected with the issue already, I think they were so shocked, particularly at the scenes of jubilation. Um, they were shocked at the result and the weight of the, the result. So I think when Westminster is trying to use the strong yes vote as a reason to say that the law in the North, Northern Ireland needs to change, I think the public in Northern Ireland actually have been invigorated to speak up in a way that they weren't before. This has been uh, in the news because the Westminster Women and Equalities Committee essentially chose to ignore the public's response to its inquiry. Is it fair to say that most of the pressure has been coming from politicians or from activist groups rather than the public? Yes, I would say the pressure is coming from outside of Northern Ireland, um, primarily. And I think... As you've said, it was interesting to note that the first um, item in the terms of reference for the committee was to seek the views of the public. And yet, as you say, the views of the public, the, the over 88 percent of the submissions to the committee from Northern Ireland were against law change. And yet, as you've already said, those submissions have effectively been ignored. Um, and I think for us, it shows that uh, the committee came into the process with a predetermined idea of what needed to happen and um, were disappointed in that because uh, it's not then the democratically expressed will of the people of Northern Ireland if Westminster imposes any law change. Now, there were, there were two marches on Westminster earlier this year. The pro-abortion march organised by Amnesty International uh, that's the one that got all the media attention. But your group, Birth Lives Matter, held a separate march supporting life. Yes, I think um, Birth Lives Matter was formed in Northern Ireland to speak into Northern Ireland. And we found ourselves needing to go to Westminster because of our um, lack of a local assembly at this stage. Um, and... I think the problem with that that we're finding is um, the the media in GB and politicians in Westminster have only been hearing one voice and one argument up until this point in time. Um, so it was very important to us when we knew that that uh, march was happening, being um, organised and, and led by Amnesty, um, we, it was quite last minute, but we felt it's really important as women from Northern Ireland to be represented um, in that place at that time to say that you're not speaking for us and 
Um, 100,000 lives are being lived today in Northern Ireland directly because of our laws. And to remind um, people in GB, I suppose, who have had, what, two generations now um, where the law has been changed to permit abortion, to remind them actually that there's a positive side to the law in Northern Ireland, which isn't talked about, it isn't acknowledged. In fact, it's denied. Um, restricting abortion does limit it significantly, as our 100,000 research has shown. So our protest that day actually was a, a celebration of the 100,000 lives being lived. Um, and it was a reminder that the, the law is there to protect life. It's not there to criminalise women um, and the law in Northern Ireland does that very well. Debates on abortion are always uh, very highly emotive affairs, highly charged. What do you think is uh, the best message for pro-lifers to be communicating in this environment? At the heart of a pregnancy crisis there are always at least two lives being held in tension and I think um, the most important message is a pro-both message that society currently is pitting a woman against her unborn child. So the, the current feminist or pro-woman narrative is saying you can be equal to men, but you have to pay a price for that equality and that price is your unborn children. Um, so we want to look at that line of argument and using lived experiences and government statistics, we say, well, you know, what has that pro-choice stroke abortion argument done for women? It has basically cheapened them as women. So we're saying a pro-both message tells women you can take your place in society, fulfill your dreams, live life to the full with your children, not instead of. So for women who are pregnant, for women who are mothers, society can do so much more um, if they think always in terms of both as opposed to one or the other. And for us, that is a much more progressive and modern um, line of reasoning. And uh, so we hope that pro-both message will go out from Northern Ireland across GB. But here in Northern Ireland, we hope we can maintain the current position of law but increase services to enable life for women and their children. Dawn, thank you very much for joining us. Time now to speak to Callum Webster on the situation regarding marriage. Firstly, I think it's worth mentioning that we seem to be seeing two campaigns being played out very similarly here. Politicians based in London are trying to impose abortion on Northern Ireland and they're also trying to impose same-sex marriage on the province too. It strikes me as uh, very undemocratic. Well, I think that that is definitely the case. There is an attempt by politicians who have no electoral interest in Northern Ireland whatsoever to try and force us uh, to adopt their particular view of marriage in our legislation and their particular perspective on abortion in our legislation. The campaign to redefine marriage, of course, has not been democratic from the start. Back in 2012, 2013, 2011, overwhelmingly the vast majority of responses opposed the redefinition of marriage and yet a majority of MPs went ahead and imposed the redefinition on the mainland. Uh, they are Those MPs are not repentant in any way. They're similarly determined to redefine marriage here in Northern Ireland. And we've seen various attempts at that over the last few years. It's very clear uh, that when the devolved assembly was up and running, that on five occasions MLAs rejected the redefinition of marriage on four occasions by a clear majority and on the fifth of occasion uh, it was rejected because it did not command majority support across both major communities in the province. So clearly the elected will of members of the Assembly elected by people in Northern Ireland has been that marriage should not be redefined. Uh, so that is undemocratic, uh, very evidently undemocratic. Perhaps you could uh, briefly walk us through what the most recent challenges to Northern Ireland's marriage laws have been and, and what you make of those attempts. 
obviously the Northern Ireland Assembly went into suspension a couple of years ago and there have been attempts at Westminster since then to impose uh, same-sex marriage here in Northern Ireland and abortion as well of course uh, but in relation to same-sex marriage a number of um, politicians from constituencies in England have been backing this move. Uh, there's a Labour MP called Conor McGinn who has been pressing and campaigning at Westminster to change the law on this. He's tabled 10-minute rule bills on the issue of same-sex marriage. Uh, He sought to table an amendment to the budget bill earlier this year. Uh, Thankfully, that amendment was withdrawn at the last minute, but it showed the, the, the mentality that was there in terms of redefining marriage here. And in the House of Lords, there are peers who have a similar mindset only this year. In February and also in March, a peer by the name of Lord Hayward uh, tabled amendments to government bills on civil registration in England uh, calling for same-sex marriage in Northern Ireland. Uh, Thankfully, they were not pressed to a vote in the end, but uh, Lord Hayward has said he is very determined to redefine marriage here. And it's worth noting that some of the co-signatories to his amendments were also calling for uh, safeguards to be removed from ministers in the Church of England who did not wish to conduct same-sex weddings on grounds of conscience. So it shows the scant regard that some uh, Westminster politicians have, uh, not only for the democratic wishes of the Northern Ireland people, but also for liberty of conscience for citizens right across our nation. And aside from uh, the push at a Westminster level, there have been various attempts in the courts. There are a number of legal cases running where people are seeking to bring the redefinition of marriage to Northern Ireland through the law courts. Uh, There are also um, public policy campaigns and media campaigns uh, to do so similarly often on the mainstream media. Uh, Same-sex marriage is is presented as as a must. Uh, Those who disagree are often vilified and criticised. Northern Ireland is demonised as a place. There there are those in the media who try and berate this province and say that it's out of step with the rest of the world. Uh, Well, in fact, they're not particularly paying attention to reality because England and Scotland have redefined marriage and so has the Irish Republic. But in terms of of a world stage by way of United Nations member states, Northern Ireland is actually in line with the vast majority of countries across our world. Those those facts are are worth considering and it is disappointing that uh, these things are not widely reported on the media, particularly on the BBC. Callum, you're a Scot, of course, but you've lived in Northern Ireland for 19 years now. I have indeed. And worked as the Christian Institute's Northern Ireland officer since 2006. What can you tell me about how the people of Northern Ireland, the people on the ground, feel about these attempts to impose abortion and impose same-sex marriage? Do they ever see it as, as being imposed from Westminster? Yes, many do, and many believe that the elected politicians to the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, to legislate on these matters, it's not for English and Scottish MPs to impose uh, a secular view upon them. Some of them are also deeply concerned about those issues because it is true uh, there are 100,000 people alive today in our world because Northern Ireland did not introduce the same abortion laws as England, Scotland and Wales back in the late 60s. Uh, So actually lives have been saved and when people are presented with that reality uh, it does make them thankful uh, that we have legislation protecting our unborn children here in this province. In relation to same-sex marriage, the vast majority of people here do believe that marriage is between a man and a woman and they want to see that upheld and they do not, they're often vilified as uh, being hateful or homophobic, but that is not true disagreement. It's not the same thing as hatred. Uh, they see the benefits that marriage brings, how it, true marriage um, recognises the complementarity of men and women. True marriage provides a stable 
background, the most stable background for raising children, raising the next generation. It brings great blessings to our society. And for those reasons, the majority of people here do wish to see marriage upheld and the majority of churches take that view as well. Well, on the subject of churches, you could argue that Northern Ireland has a higher density of evangelical Christians than perhaps other parts of the UK. Do you think this has helped to inform people's views on these issues? Well, I've no doubt it has had an impact. People have recognised uh, that when we go with God's design for our lives and his instructions, it is for our blessing. These things are not there to harm us. God is our creator and he knows how human societies best function as well as how human individuals best function. And he's laid down his instructions, his moral law for his glory, but also for the good of men and women. And within Northern Ireland, probably a higher proportion of people are are aware of that. They're conscious of that. It does shape their thinking. Uh, But it is also seen to to, to work in practice. We are a family-oriented society in Northern Ireland, the wider family network probably plays a bigger role than it does in many places on the mainland Uh, and that does bring benefits, it brings blessings uh, to the culture as a whole, it is a more restrained culture, crime rates generally speaking in the province here are lower than in any other part of the United Kingdom on, on most areas of crime so you know not saying the family unit's the only factor in that but it is a factor. What do you think will be the next line of attack that politicians and activists are likely to use? And how do you think pro-marriage, pro-family campaigners can combat that? Well, there may be a number of of avenues that that people seek to go down. Certainly, uh, there is an attempt, and we're already seeing this, to vilify those who defend traditional marriage or who defend the unborn child and activists are calling them hateful, anti-women, uh, calling them homophobic and simply interpreting disagreement as hatred. And uh, there may well be more of that. People are very negative when an alternative viewpoint uh, is put forward. There are also very emotional arguments being put forward in regard to these things. You know, People forget that a hard case makes bad law, but hard cases are, are being used to try and promote some of these changes to legislation and that when people seek to present an alternative narrative they are often they, they're often presented as uncaring uh, or, or other emotional arguments are used and um, there are also attempts in the media to to write a different narrative as well and you know of, there are many people who have had situations with a uh, difficult pregnancies but who have chosen to keep their children, uh, children with life-limiting conditions and yet they've chosen to keep them and make the most of the short time uh, as parents they have with their child. And many of these people do not receive coverage on the mainstream media. They do not get airtime on some of the radio phone in shows that are in this province. So there's almost a silencing out of an alternative viewpoint and that is quite dangerous because people don't always know that that is going on and the media really are not there uh, to act in a biased manner. The media should not be there as campaigners, they should be impartial and they should present both sides of a story in an even-handed way Uh, but unfortunately that does not always happen. I'm afraid our time is up. Callum, thanks for speaking to us today. Okay, thank you very much then. And thank you very much for listening today. You can find out more about abortion and same-sex marriage on our website. In particular, I would encourage you to check out our Choose Life video series in which people tell their personal stories of how they were deeply affected by abortion. That's all for this time. Goodbye.